Hi, everyone. I'm Rick Nelson, AASHTO SciCop coordinator, and welcome to today's webinar, the second showcasing the use of technology in achieving the maintenance mission. If you missed our first webinar showcasing maintenance technologies, you can find the recording on the SciCop Talks Winter Ops website at SciCopTalksWinterOps.com. For those of you who might not know, SciCop stands for the Snow and Ice Cooperative Program, and we're AASHTO's Winter Maintenance Technical Service Program. SciCop works closely with AASHTO's Committee on Maintenance and their Maintenance Operations Technical Working Group, and together we're bringing you this webinar today. <coughs> For the next 60 minutes, our two presenters will brief you on their use of technology to address some unique challenges in their maintenance operations. But before we get started, I'd like to remind you that today's webinar is being recorded and the recording will be available at a future date on the SciCop Talks Winter Ops website. There will be time for our presenters to respond to questions, so use the chat pod in the lower right-hand side of your screen to post your questions and I'll pose them to our presenters. Our first presenter today is Joe Thompson, the Snow and Ice Program Manager for the New York State DOT. Good afternoon, Rick. You, uh, can you see my screen? I can see your screen and I can hear you just fine, Joe. Perfect. Well, uh, thanks for this uh, opportunity. I think June is the best time to talk about snow and ice all the time. Um, but uh, the opportunity to showcase this viewer of all things snow and ice in New York State. Uh, we're always trying to innovate our operations while uh, facing increased uh, level of service demands and uh, while trying to optimize snow and ice operations. Uh, this app has become a trusted source of timely information and data, insisting both situational awareness and as, and as a tool for operational planning and decision making. Um, the app, or more aptly a viewer, is a, flat, is a flagship app in our uh, system of engagement series um, that serves as a source of authoritative information that answers commonly asked questions. Uh, it's comprehensive and available 24-7 uh, without having to track down a subject matter expert. It's the first of many apps and viewers that uh, we're working on. Um, and the way to think of it with the system of engagement is uh, think of your go-to person uh, never retiring and being available 24-7. Um, some of the other apps that we're working on and in, in, that are in production now is this winter operations app, uh, a surface waters viewer, a flood watch viewer, uh, an aviation facilities viewer, a pavement and bridge viewer, um, stuff in development, or a safety viewer, a projects viewer, a hazardous tree app, um, a share extent widget, and in the conceptual phases are some uh, a nighttime sign reflectivity, traffic operations app, and secondary assets viewers for guide rail signs, drainage, etc., and also a STIP data viewer. What you see here is a, a, a Typical screen grab from this past winter uh, in a kind of an all in snow and ice uh, event. Minus Long Island down here, you'll see that uh, we didn't have any trucks out at that time. Um, on the front end, it does require some maintenance of lists because we just want to see uh, plow trucks that are out there. We don't want to see an AVL feed of the light fleet or, uh, or something that's not germane to snow and ice. So there is a little bit of uh, upkeep care and feeding. Uh, as of today, the intent of this landing page is uh, for general situation awareness, given vis visibility to managers and executive management. Uh, and it, it is currently only forward facing. We don't have a external facing uh, site yet. Uh, similar to, I know Vermont has a find my plow and uh, PA or our neighbors has a where's my plow on their 511 PA. But uh, we're, uh, we haven't entered the public domain on it yet. But uh, since, since many agencies are using AVL to help manage their fleet, uh, we've taken the lead with those other agencies uh, with asset works and fleet focus for that to be a central uh, statewide inventory and a location of the AVL feed with a separate module just for that. Um, the functionality extends beyond uh, DOT for sure. Uh, because there is visibility at our uh, Office of Emergency Management, and it's, uh, they have a, their own common operating picture where 
there's value in seeing this information there. Um, right now, the screen grab you're seeing was when we were in production. We do kind of we do turn it off the production tier off in the summertime uh, to save money, but it, it runs in three tiers. And the next tier you'll see here is uh, from our staging tier, and this is just this last week, so it's a it's a different picture. But what uh, what comes up as default on layers coming in, and that just uh, showing this is the staging tier. Are these four layers here, which are the uh, the plow trucks, our help trucks, our winter travel advisory layer, and the active radar layer. Now, for any of these layers, there's there's three dots here. You can you can uh, select that, and there's a nice feature here because you can move the layers up or down. You can zoom to that layer, and uh, or show the, the details or the Esri details from that from that layer. And of course, to change the transparency. So that's a, it's a nice feature. I'll talk about it a little bit later. When you change the transparency, you can see uh, different items, you know, that are on the bottom or on the top. And uh, in addition to being able to move the layers up and down. Uh, additionally, just uh, on this, this goes for all of the viewers and apps. The, the base map functionality is quite nice. You can switch from a number of different uh, map backgrounds, uh, from satellite imagery to a, a grayscale. Uh, sometimes the grayscale is nice because it's nice and basic, and you can see other things more clearly. Uh, National Geographic street and topo and, and terrain. Um, we use a, the information button here to show um, some labeling or key features that uh, we, we might not necessarily be able to see in the legend of the actual app. So for this, we have uh, our 511 uh, incidents, accidents, closures, um, but also our winter travel advisory, what the different colors mean from uh, green, generally clear and dry, to wet, snow and ice, severe snow, closed, portions closed. And then brown is no report. Also is a, a measuring feature that you can quickly uh, measure from one point to the next. You can see a, over here on the on the right, just a quick measure from Binghamton to Albany. And uh, you can change those units. You can also measure area. Um, but this is a, a nice feature if you're if you know for a dispatcher if they're you know, looking at a truck um, and where it is, they can also type in an address up here in the geocoder, and it'll take you right to that address. Um, with that known, dropping that pin where the address is, you could quickly look at and measure the distance between a truck and a, and a location, um, which could be real quick and handy information to have to it for a dispatcher. The rest of the operational layers uh, in the app, of course, there's the snow plows and our help trucks that were, you know, defaultly shown in the, when it first comes up. But additionally, it has all of our 511 information and a feed there, which obviously that can be really helpful in a snow and ice operation or a snow and ice event, accidents, you know, enclosures, as well as our uh, 511 cameras. Additionally, we have the winter travel advisory. The winter travel advisory is a is something that's reported out by our residencies to you know the actual road conditions, and we'll have that on there. You saw that earlier on the legend what uh, what they meant. The actual radar, the active radar. Of course, it's static. It's not. Uh, it's not. Uh, you can't play it and play it forward. Uh, the snowfall predictive. Um, the NDFD, that's the National Digital Forecast Database, and that's that's proved to be a really reliable source of predictive 72-hour snowfall, uh, and it's uh, what the National Weather Service is actually putting out as a, as a forecast. So all the local National Weather Service offices report that up in, and I believe, I think NOAA puts it out, and uh, it, like I said, it's become a, 
a, a really valuable tool. Additionally, we have uh, New York State Mesonet weather sites across the state. And we'll have a slide on that a little bit later. And then other, you know, our, our boundaries, our district boundaries, our regional boundaries, county boundaries are all there. Um, one of the things we put in here, which is again a very useful tool, is each one of our snow and ice beats uh, has been mapped. So for us, on what we do on our system with state forces, there are, there's a 1,474 beats, and those beats have been divided up into these categories in the terms of emergency operations: priority A, priority B, uh, municipal, which is blue and then all other normal beats would be green, but the priority A are, are red. Uh, additionally, we've got stockpile information and quantities with uh, indicators for low stock. And lastly on the bottom is a, a live feed for uh, current traffic condition. So here's the, uh, the mesonet layer, and you can see that these are the, the weather sites throughout New York State and it was added as a layer. When you click on one of the sites, it opens up a um, information page, and that goes for all the all the layers that are shown. If you if you click on them, you'll get information. But what's embedded here is a nice hot link to that uh, Mesonet site. So you click on the URL station page, and up comes that station, which has its own camera uh, forecast relative humidity, dew point, wind, gust, uh, station pressure, uh, all those things that are, you know, everything except uh, pavement pavement temperature. But that's a that's a nice feature. Now going back to our snow and ice beats, as I talked about earlier, the, the red is our priority A network. And if you're familiar with New York State at all, you'll this this will make sense to you. You see the those red roads are uh, interstates, high volume roads, uh, system critical roads. So um, they've been mapped that way, embedded uh, through our emergency operation playbook. And you'll see there's a few gaps here and those are, that's an ongoing effort to, uh, to close them and, and make, them, make them whole. The, the beats themselves were based on a, a reference marker system, and now we're switching over to uh, ESRI Roads and Streets linear referencing system. So they need to be uh, edited, and that's a, a separate effort that's going on. Now this, you know, the transparency I talked about earlier um, with this is, is quite nice in the sense that you can use the layering to analyze some potential risks um, here we have the, the layer of the weather and the 72-hour predictive snowfall, and the dark purple being uh, 36 inches. Now, with layering this along with those beats, you could you know, identify some potential risks on the priority A or B network, or even where the risks are going to be regionally or within a residency. Um, so this is a good op this is a good example of the, the kind of the operational program management, the how and why of uh, decision making. Um, like I said, that NDFD is a nice layer because it's it's all the weather models in you know in one and that's their forecast. But uh, it may be advantages. It may, there may be an advantage for us later to have uh, maybe the European models or some other GS, all the some of the models specifically shown because sometimes that'll that'll help folks in making operational decisions. And now you see the you know the priorities of those beats. So if you had you know purple on red, there there could be an issue where you might want to redirect some resources toward that area. Uh, similarly, with the traffic layer being on the bottom and the snowplow beats on top, you can use some layering to, you know, during a storm to find out where there could be an issue. You see the, you know, the beat, the priority A is a red. 
and traffic, the red is stop and go to green being free flowing. You look at a corridor and you can see um, if it's red on green, then everything is fine. But if it was red on red, uh, you know that there's standstill traffic and it's a priority network. So you instantly know there's something wrong. Now it's also uh, available. You can run this app on an iPhone. This was some of these are screen grabs from a uh, uh, iPhone 6. Um, this is another typical kind of all-in event. Here's one where it's kind of further going out. You can see the, the system kind of exiting the state and the reporting changing and the trucks going in. And this last one was. Uh, where we had a, you know, the traffic layers underneath, and you can see it's red in one direction. There was an accident, a truck rollover, um, so there was standstill traffic there. But it was um, an easy place to go and quickly look at it, and you can see that our trucks were in the area and out. So it was, uh, you know, a handy tool to kind of just do a screen grab of all this, and you can have it in your pictures and use for documentation later. That is one thing that. Uh, you know you can't go back in history on this it's a it's a viewer so it's meant to it's meant to be live so you can't mine out the information later which uh is only you know only downfall but uh, we are working on another app to look at uh, snow and ice operations and as a tool to how well we responded to a storm the nice thing with this too on a on a phone you can grab it and the the, the time is up there so you can have a nice timestamp one of the things I'm going to uh, ask for going forward is maybe a date stamp um, on the map as well, just so you have it. So when you do have a screen grab, you, you can show the date and the time on it. For any of the layers, when you click uh, on a truck or on a, on a feature, you'll get a pop-up window. And that pop-up window will have the relevant information or the information that's being you know, fed through it. Um, in this case, is a, a snowplow with a WebTech uh, AVL system, and we've uh, we're trying a, a number of different AVL providers that have an application programming interface to our material spreaders, so we can get that information and stream it through, um, as well as uh, air and road temp too. So it, it's a, that's another powerful tool where you can have you think about all those, you know, an, an all-out event where just under 1,500 trucks are out. You've got that many kind of mini ARWIS stations. And I grabbed this from last week. Again, you can see it's in development. But uh, so the the values are blank. But there's just a typical list of you know what the rates, where the rates would be if it's pre-wet, uh, spinner settings, uh, spread width, gate settings, all that information. As long as it's programmed in, it would stream through, and you'd have visibility of it here. Uh, each one of those layers has attributes, and you can export that data, which is another really nice feature. And each one is expressed as a table. So we'll look at plow beats, for example. Um, you click again, click on those three dots, and then you get a, um, options to disable the pop-up or open an attribute table, or again, look at the descriptions. But if you open the attribute table within that window, you'll see all of that specific detail relevant to uh, that layer, um, which is really, which was really nice because you can then, you can take that, go to the options and select uh, the option to download that information into a CS, CSV file that you can look at later on. Another nice feature is uh, right next to that options here is that filter by map, map extent and that's quite nice because if you if what you'll get in that table in a return is what you're zoomed into um, so if you're not sure about it uh, 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 an asset and you're moving into it that list will keep on going smaller and smaller until you zoom right into it if you zoom into just one you'll get just one on the return of what you're looking at Now for the telematics on the snow plows themselves, 
the uh, the real power here for us is that it's uh, we can have multiple geo event feeds from multiple AVL providers for multiple agencies in one location. So uh, for us, we have our trucks and also the New York State Thruways trucks that we have visibility of. Um, and it also has some visual cues there operationally that we're that we're concerned with. Um, a blue dot shows up as a park truck, and part of the QA on this is if the date stamp on that truck is older than 30 minutes, it will not show up on the map. And that's uh, that's with the intent that this is kept as a you know a situation situational awareness tool for storms. So if a, a bunch of trucks are parked or stopped, you're not going to see that after 30 minutes. And then, of course, truck speed. Our big indicator here for two colors is 35 miles an hour, because anything over 35 miles an hour in snow and ice operation is too fast. It's above our policy. But 35 and below is recommended for bounce and scatter and safety. Um, the additional feature here with uh, trucks that are actively spreading material, if uh, material spreader is on, you'll see the icon, but you'll also see a couple of uh, trails behind it. Just have these two guys in echelon. Uh, lastly, we have our stockpile information. This is all of our stockpile. We have uh, a layer for uh, bulk salt, like pre-treated salt and salt brine. Uh, we left off our stockpiles for liquid mag and liquid calcium. But the uh, the idea here is if it's 39% uh, or low, it'll show up as a red location. Um, and 80% 80, 80 to 100% is green. And then that uh, summertime means it's uh, time to fill the barns. And uh, that's uh, that's a, a, a brief uh, description of what we have and the functionality. Um, I think uh, I think you wanted to save the questions to the end of the second presentation. But uh, if you have any questions, you know, put them in the in the chat chat box. And I think uh, with that, it may be a fine time to brine in <laughs> South Carolina. <laughs> Very, very good, very good, Joe. Thank you so much. And and again, uh, a reminder: if you do have questions uh, about this particular presentation, please uh, type them in the chat box in the lower right-hand corner. And with that, we'll transition to here from uh, South Carolina. And so, uh, with that, uh, Todd, uh, the show is yours. All right, thank you. And I'm hoping everybody's seeing my. Uh... First slide, you yes, got it right. It's coming All right. up just fine. All right, good. Again, my name is Todd Cook. I'm a district engineer, uh, maintenance engineer for the state of South Carolina. Um, we're in district four, so a little geographic if you want to try to get a feel for where we're at. If you take North Carolina and look at the city of Charlotte, I hope everybody knows Carolina Panthers um, and, and that. and. Uh, but if you go south of Charlotte on 77 and run into South Carolina, you run in our district. If you go west on 85 and run into South Carolina from Charlotte, you go into our district as well. So we're we're just bordering uh, North Carolina uh, for the most part of our district, just south of Charlotte. So um, anyway, we believe it or not, we do get a little snow in South Carolina. And we're kind of unique. I've been with the department almost 20 years. Um, seen a lot of things. I've seen two foot snowfalls. Uh, I've seen thunder snows. Uh, and so we do get the glamorous on that. Uh, if you've never seen a thunder snow, I don't know what that is. That's when it's snowing like to beat the band and, and you got thunder and lightning in with it. So it's pretty neat when that happens. We get that usually about every two or three years we'll see. It's pretty common. Uh, but the one thing that is common for us and that we always have to uh, think about is with every event, uh, we're going to see just about everything that when you think of inclement weather, what it could be. 
whether it's snow, sleet, snow, sleet, all at the same time, snow, sleet, rain, a mix of ice, freezing rain, just plain ice. We're going to get it all, and we're probably going to get it all in the duration of one single event. Uh, so it's always for us, whenever we think of inclement weather, we think of not just one event, but just about every scenario that you could think of within, think of within a single event. So it, it does become a challenge for us in that aspect. Uh, so with the challenges that we come up with, uh, you know, we're, we're looking at technology, and we do use technology, but we also use, um, you know, we're from the South, and I get kidded a lot about my Southern accent, and so we, we're old school in a lot of ways. Uh, we kind of mix it both. We'll look at the technology, but then we're also thinking, well, how does that apply to the real world and, and what we're facing each day? So kind of going to touch on four uh, topics uh, during the course of this presentation. One is what the public expects, uh, media focus, uh, and we are driven uh, by both um, when we look at how we uh, fight snow and ice and, and inclement weather. Um, and then one thing for us, I mentioned before, the ever-changing forecast, and, and we're not huge. I mean, this we do get snow, but it's not like we're going to get it all winter long. Uh, we may have two, three events in a season. Uh, so we have equipment, but we're not as large as, as a lot of the DOTs. And, you know, we're also facing, I'm sure everybody is, uh, we've had people retire. Um, we've lost a lot of workforce, a lot of experience. And how do we motivate and get uh, our new employees to, to handle snow and, and be accustomed to, to working with it? So talk a little bit about public, what the public expects, what the media expects. You know, one thing about me, I'll come up with, I'll butcher the English language if he hadn't figured that out already. But um, I'll, I'll come up with some little toddism. And uh, when we look at bear payment, you know, obviously we think, well, there's nothing on the road, no snow. And then, but we've got passable, and I always say that's no slow. Uh, passable, I don't think, means a daggum thing to anybody that goes out there on the road. Uh, it's funny, down here in the south, um, as soon as they say it's going to snow, uh, everybody runs out, got to get bread and milk. So they can't get out. They, they expect they're going to be snowed in for a couple weeks at a time, even though the event maybe only lasts for a day uh, at the most. It, it might last a week, but that's rare, rare for us. Uh, but anyway, everybody's going to stock out. All the stores are going to be without bread and milk. And then when it hits, the first thing that everybody does as soon as it snows is they got to get out of the house and go see what's open so they can go get something to eat. Uh, so I, I've never had figured out, but that's always been the course uh, through my lifetime that everybody always does. So when they get out, um, even though the conditions are they're not the greatest, um, they just don't seem to realize that. And uh, even though the road may have a lane uh, and normally the speed limit may be 55 on the interstate, it may be 60 or 70 that's what they expect to drive so you know even when they see the snow for us down here uh very few very few people actually slow down um again and, and so from our standpoint for the agency uh we're kind of we have a bare payment uh philosophy and that's bare payment not so much as quick as we can get but we try to keep it uh through the course of the event uh so yeah, you know, it's a little tough when when it's actually snowing and you're trying to keep the roads clear and bare pavement means there is no snow, there is no ice, there is no moisture on the road really, um, and everything against you is putting that down. So, you know, it's we're trying to see well what can we do uh, to get there and to make it best for us so so we can get there and for us. In our district, what we use, and and I'll be honest, we use it more than any other district in the state. Every event is salt brine. Um, now, when you say salt brine to the media, uh, I think they look at it as some magic elixir that does great things. 
uh, you know, my thing is we've always had salt brine. Even when I first started uh, with the department, we didn't have any brine making capacity. We didn't have any applicators, any way to put it down, but we still made salt brine. And when I say that is we used to sit around and we'd have everything ready. And this was 20 years ago, everything loaded. And we basically would wait until something failed, until we had that moisture. And then we'd go out and put rock salt and it would react with that moisture and make salt brine. So even when you put out rock salt, you're putting out you're you're putting out salt brine. What we do is kind of increase it somewhat. We 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 speed up that process because we'll we actually have the salt brine capabilities. We make our own. So we're just taking that salt, mixing it with water and making salt brine, and then we'll put it on on the roadways. So one thing I've kind of noticed with the media is they always kind of expect it to be this magic potion that's supposed to dissolve uh, salt, I mean, dissolve uh, the snow, dissolve the ice from forming on the roadway. That's really not what we're trying to do. Uh, you know, when we all, always get a kick, um, you know, I'll hear folks, the media, and there'll be someone talking, and, and the first thing a lot of times that comes out, they'll ask the question, well, why didn't the salt brine work? And I always kind of ask, so what well, works? It's just, you know, it's you're in a condition or environment where, you know, it's there's no guarantees, and, and you got to kind of relate that. If you look at salt brine uh, from a laboratory setting, I mean, you you can be in a lab and it'll keep water from freezing to temperatures minus six uh, Fahrenheit, but when we're out on that roadway, uh, it's not going to do that it's not going to react that way. Um, so, you know, we have the technology and that's why I say we kind of mix it. We, and then what do we see out in the real world? Uh, one thing I've kind of noticed and, and by no means you'll find, you won't find this in any text, but it's just what I've kind of observed throughout the years is when we apply it, um, I feel pretty good about salt brine by itself. Uh, on the roadways, the temperatures is about 26 degrees. Um, and, and the reason I've, I've come up with that through the years is just by seeing it. I've seen a lot of storms where we've actually, uh, and I ride the interstates quite a bit during events, where the roads will look great. Um, not only are they passable, but they're they're bare pavement. And so it, it basically, we're, we're applying the right amount of chemical applying the right amount of, of plowing and doing all that. So, you know, everybody's going posted speed. I mean, it looks good. And the temperatures have hover, hovered between 27, 26. And as soon as it hits 25, you know, you're seeing people spinning everywhere. And from, I guess, from a media standpoint, it's just like, well, what went wrong? Well, nothing went wrong. That's just what you had at that time for the chemical that you had um that was re re working really there's no guarantees uh if temperature is 32 eventually it's going to freeze i cannot prevent uh any moisture on the road uh from freezing sooner or later it's going to freeze um our hopes is that i can just keep it slushy enough uh to get it off the roadway and that's what we're trying to do uh, a couple other things that we do here in district four is you know, what happens when it gets below that 26 degrees? Well, then I kind of look at what we call hot shot. And we'll take and put calcium chloride and mix that in with our salt brine. Uh, it's about a 20% mixture that we're doing. Realistically, that kind of gets me uh, to temperatures in that 20 to 25 range. Uh, but then when it starts getting below into the teens, um, even that becomes less effective. Uh, there has been times when we we went straight calcium chloride just to break it up. But to uh, be honest with you, I'm not a big fan of straight calcium. Um, and, and one of the reasons why is, you know, it's kind of tricky when you run calcium. Uh, you know, I've heard tales of people, well, I don't have salt brine, so I'll use calcium chloride uh, to make, as my salt brine. Uh, what, one of the fears I have, and 
again, I come up with some crazy terms one time, but sometimes, but I think that that calcium, if you put that strictly on a bare pavement um, and the roadway is not too cold, and by that, if, it, if it's above freezing or even, you know, a few degrees below freezing, uh, I think you get snotty pavement. And, it, and that's what I call it. It's, it, it's basically a, you're going to get a, a very slick film on top that's going to sit on that pavement uh, just from the calcium itself. Uh, so you got to kind of keep that in consideration. Uh, my way, my way of thinking is when, even if I use calcium chloride, strict, you know, straight calcium uh, on a roadway, even when it's cold, eventually it, it's going to heat up. And if there's any leftover calcium, uh, it could at some point uh, fall and get slick as well and get that snotty effect. So I'm not a big fan of just straight calcium, but I do like it mixing it with our salt brine. I think it's very effective. Um, so again, this is what a couple of slides here, what we're trying to get uh, something that we can push off with the plows. Cause really with that salt brine, uh, our main focus is, is to get it where we can prevent the bonding uh, so we can push it off the road waves with our plows. That's really what we're trying to accomplish uh, with, with with the brine application, and even when we're just putting out straight salt and making that. Um, again, not going to get into a lot of details. I, I can if anybody wants, but you know we're trying on our salt brine to get to a 23% consistency, um, and you know we're when we're in a pre-treatment mode and really even when we're in a de-icing mode, and we use it both for pre-treatment and de-icing in our district, uh, we're trying to, you know, we're trying to get 40 gallons uh, per lane mile. Uh, there's roughly two and a half pounds of salt per gallon, so you can kind of figure that. Um, one reason I like the salt brine, um, you, you look at the cost, yeah, I'm going to have for every lane mile cost for treatment, I'm going to have about five five dollars and fifty cents using salt brine. If I use just straight rock salt, uh, it's going to be about fourteen dollars a lane mile cost. So just some little numbers up, but um, don't want to get in a lot of detail on that. So I talked a little bit about our forecast in South Carolina, and um, they are tricky to say, say the least. Uh, next couple of slides, I'm going to kind of give you a, a brief, just stuff that we have to deal with. And I'll tell you right off, one of the things that's not on my PD, but I find I do a lot of is that's being a weatherman. Uh, so I use a lot of, I look at a lot of weather forecasts. I have a lot that come to me. Uh, I use every a avenue that I can on, on weather forecasts and weather prediction. Uh, for one, to try to figure out what it's going to do, um, because we got to get ready to protect the citizens and keep our roads passable, and then we also got to get let our folks know. Because for us, when we have an event, it, it's basically all hands on deck, uh, especially all the maintenance uh, and also construction, and, and basically our entire district, one shape or form, will be involved in, in snow operations, inclement weather operations. So this was last year, uh, early de early December actually, which is uh, really early for us. We'll get a couple events, but it's usually not a big event. Uh, and I usually don't get too worried about early winter events because usually the roadway itself is uh, a little bit warmer than I'll get after the winter season. If this had been March, I probably would have been sweating out if March 3rd versus December 3rd. I probably would have been more concerned than I would be on December 3rd, but nevertheless, we got this. And so I'm getting this and say, ah, well, looks like we might get something. That's odd. Uh, but send out, kind of let our folks know, hey, uh, something's brewing. We just know how, how to keep an eye on it. So that's on a Monday. So then Tuesday come around, comes along and, um, well, now it's starting to look a little bit more interesting. You know, a couple of inches. This time of year, that's a little odd for us, but it's not out of the ordinary. Uh, because if you look a little bit north of that slide, 
we're not too far from the mountain. Uh, you know, within two hours from where I live in, in South Carolina, I, I can be sitting in, in the mountains at about 3,500 foot elevation. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not that far. We're really not far from the mountains of North Carolina, even, even from the mountains of South Carolina. So it, it's not, you know, it's, it's in the range. But anyway, we got this on, on, on the next Tuesday, the next day. So I said, all right, well, definitely at this point, I'm looking at this and I'm looking at all the other forecasts and I'm putting our folks on notice that, hey, it looks like we may get something Saturday. Just let everybody know there's a good chance we may be in operational mode over the weekend. So that's on a Tuesday. So now Wednesday morning, that's the slide to the left. Uh, well, it looks a little bit better. You know, it's I'm here. This is 77. So these first three counties here, that's York, Chester, Fairfield, that's in our district along 77. And this county here, there's Charlotte, that's Cherokee County, and that's I-85 that runs through our state. And then it hits, this is District 3, um, and uh, we communicate with them on any event um, as well. But, you know, I'm, I'm worried about operations in Cherokee County. So I'm not far. I mean, you know, it's showing right here. Uh, so, but anyway, Wednesday morning, I, I'm not, I'm looking a little bit better. It looks better than it did yesterday. But then this is Wednesday afternoon. So in a period of about six hours, uh, there's been a big change in the forecast. Not uncommon uh, for us to see in, in an event like this or any event. And then by that time, I get something from our uh, from our state uh, weatherman, um, and basically he's predicting if you look down here, 10 to 14 inches. So now it's a pretty big event. You know, five to seven on 85 corridor. North South Carolina border, 10 to 14 inches. That's us, you know, that's my district. Um, so at this point, you know, we're, we're getting uh, geared up. For us, when we have to commit to a storm, um, at about 72 hours out from the storm, I'm committed. Whether it does it or not, uh, I'm committed to that storm and and we're we're on the process of going so this storm is going to hit uh saturday night sunday morning timetable right after midnight uh so by this is wednesday uh i'm getting ready to basically pull the plug and actually the, the scenario that this worked out uh when i got this i got this at lunchtime and i got the other forecast prior to that at 5 p.m on wednesday uh, Wednesday night, I'm texting all my engineers saying, hey, you're probably going to see something in the morning from me saying we're, we're going to be operational this, this weekend for a major snow event. And that was the case. This is Thursday morning. Got that forecast there. And that's a pretty major event. You know, it's showing a foot of snow on the 85 corridor, along 77 in York County half a foot and then on down to a couple inches south of that. So uh, it, you're looking at basically uh, most of our district involved in some kind of uh, inclement weather event forecasting. So at this point, uh, we're geared up. We're, we've already said, you know, the email has been sent to me saying notify all your folks, we'll be uh, operational. We're gonna start pre-treating uh, and I like to pre-treat uh, about 36 hours uh, ahead of the storm uh, to get everything if I can. Um, but that was that was Thursday morning. Thursday afternoon, oh, then changed again on me. Uh, but it's a little bit better, but it's still they're still predicting uh, snowfall for our district, and so we're still getting ready for it, and we will be ready for it. Uh, now Friday rolls around. On the left side and left top. And right and left is in the AM. So now I've got snowfall on this side. I've got now I've got ice. Now they're talking about ice as well for our district. And so that's showing up on the AM report uh, as well. So still it's good, still expecting something that's fluctuating. Now Friday afternoon comes around. Eh, it's looked a little bit more favorable for snow and ice. 
because uh, this is Friday afternoon here and there. Uh, so now I'm, I'm I'm good though. We're getting ready for it uh, by Friday. Uh, we're pre-treating, uh, so we're 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 getting ready. Even though the forecast, and it doesn't really get into this one, but on this particular forecast, which is the case for a lot of our events, they're forecasting it to start as rain. Um, and normally for us, when it rains, it's going to rain for about two to three hours before it changes over to sleet snow. Um, and then it may change over to snow. And then it may go back and forth to another sleet snow. And then it may change over to ice and freezing rain. So it, it kind of goes back and forth to us. But a lot of times, it will start off as rain just enough to kind of wash out all the pretreatment that I did prior to that, um, which is another reason why we're 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 always in an anti-icing mode uh, as well as a de-icing mode. And so they get this Friday as well uh, from the state uh, weatherman, and he's also saying, "Hey, it's coming." Uh, quite probably not quite as bad as it was before, but it, it, it's still coming. And then Saturday, I get this top is Saturday morning, bottom is Saturday evening. Uh, at least for certain that we're going to get something uh, tonight, but we're good. We've got everything pre-treated at this point. Uh, we've got our crews sc scheduled to come in, and um, we're in good shape. So we're just waiting for it to start. And lo and behold. It comes around Sunday, and remember, this was Saturday night. Six hours later, Sunday morning, it's basically saying, eh, eh, well, it's not coming, but you're still going to probably get some ice. The you know, snow is not, not what you're going to get. And then later in the day, I get this. It pretty much says, well, it's warming up. It, it's going to not be quite as bad as we thought it was going to be. Um, in actuality, what actually happened is, if you remember probably back to Tuesday's forecast, uh, it was probably the closest. Uh, we did, we'll get a lot of the times when we'll get a storm that'll occur. Um, it likes to go across the state, run up through Charlotte and a lot of them, and go out to sea and go up the coastline and head up north to New York. Um, but when it hits that coast, it likes to start spinning. And we'll get a wraparound effect. And so we usually get snow. By that time, the cold weather starts to come in behind it. And we'll usually get, when we think everything's good, uh, even when we get an event that does snow and ice, we get everything cleared. And for us, our first priority is always the interstate, then the primary routes, and then the secondary. So don't be surprised for us if I don't have the interstate and most of the primaries cleared starting to work on the secondaries and that tail end of that storm whips around and gives us about another hour to two hours worth of snowfall when it leaves to add another and throw about another inch or so on top of us, uh, which is kind of what happened here. Uh, you know, it came in the tail end, parts of Cherokee and parts of York County. Uh, did get snowfall um, anywhere from a dusting to half half a foot on some areas. So it's not uncommon for us to see those kind of patterns develop. So for us, um, that's kind of what our forecast looks like. And then we're trying to figure out, well, how do we, we battle it? Um, we don't have, you know, that 422 people, that is, just about everybody within our district, within all seven counties, maintenance, construction, district crews, district engineering. Uh, we have more folks on that FTEs, but what we've experienced, especially the past two or three years with the vacancy rates is we're like, we're typically gonna run about 420 to about 460 employees. Uh, we're, we're FTE slotted for just over five, but it's, we're, quite frankly, we, we're having trouble filling in all our vacancies. Um, it, it's just one of the battles, another battle that we face. 
Um, resources wise, equipment wise, I've got about 88 uh, plow and sander units um, that we can utilize. And I have 49 salt brine applicators. And for us, our applicators range from 250 gallon, 500 gallon to 1,000 gallon applicators uh, that we put on our trucks. And then we have our super tankers that we use for our um, pre-treatment operations. And, and I've got 4,000 gallon uh, super tankers that we use. I've got super tankers that we've made homemade. I'll talk a little bit about that in the upcoming slides. Uh, we're utilizing some of our equipment and buying tanks on that, um, showing how much salt we have and how much uh, brine storage capacity that we have both permanent and on a temporary basis. Uh, we utilize both. When we started the program in 2005, uh, we had a storage capacity of 10,000 gallons and we had two brine applicators. So from 2005 to where we're at now, we've increased that to a level that we feel comfortable with. So um, I'll show some slides upcoming about our brine making facilities, our, our tank farms, you know, when we have the tank farms, those so storage. And then we have rental locations as well that we started uh, a couple of years ago uh, we rent through the months of the 15th through the of December to March 15th. Uh, that's usually our snow period, and we'll put those at locations along the interstate and primary routes. Our rental tanks we do not use for pre-treatment anti-icing operations; they're for de-icing. Um, you know, and we utilize them there because I'm looking at turnaround time. Uh, when we're on the interstate and primaries uh, for a lot of our locations, it takes, if we were to leave, go back to the shop yard to fill up and, and restock with, with material, uh, we're looking at about an hour and a half before we get back to where we left. Uh, when the event's happening, that's, that's a little bit too long. So we've, we've put these tank farms or tank rental farms uh, at locations that so I, that time can be to less than an hour. Um, usually it's been within about 30 to 40 minutes. You know, get out and come back. So that's one of our brine facilities. Um, years ago I used to be over our capital improvements and so um, one of the ideas that I had was since brine was so critical to our operations I wanted to make sure that the people that were making the brine uh, was as comfortable as we could. I didn't want them outside exposed to the weather. I wanted them in a heat environment uh, so they could make the brine as quick as, as and keep up with, with what we were using it uh, for. Uh, so it is probably in when the storm hit. It's probably even though it's it is wet, uh, it is salty, but it's one of the more comfortable. Um, facilities and, and operations that we have uh, during the event. And, and I think that's key. Um, outside, and, and we're very simple. Uh, everything that we do, you'll see the, these motors here for the pumps. Um, you'll see the hoses, uh, everything standard. If you go through one county to the next, it's going to be the same size hose, same size fitting, uh, same pumps uh, for the most part. So, you know, we're, and we've got multiples of each. But the thing is, if, if we have issues, uh, we can always go to a different county and everything should be standardized. So we try to do that as well. If you look here, these are two. Um, of the applicators that will come to us um, and that we apply. And that's basically our tanks, our double wall tanks. They're about 5,500 gallons each. And we will have these stationed at just about every maintenance facility. Uh, we'll have them at our section sheds. We have them at some areas that we have right away on that we own. So we keep all those. Um, Pretty much, and, and part of our 
we keep them full, but then we'll recirculate throughout the year to, to make sure we keep the, uh, the salt brine mix. These are applicators. These are actually ones that we get from our depot. Um, these all have a pump. Um, the ones that we make in-house are all gravity fed. Um, probably if I had to pick uh, which I prefer, I prefer the gravity. It's less parts that, that go, it could uh, be an issue, less maintenance on them. That's basically a switch and the, and the chemical comes out. So these are thousand gallon tanks. These do require that the operator have a uh, uh, the, on a tanker endorsement on their CDL. And this is a, a basically a homemade system that we make. Um, one of the reasons that we went to the homemade systems, both on our trucks, and I'll talk a little bit here shortly, show some slides with some of our trailers is you know we, we don't have a lot of equipment i talked about that so there were of course we had our dump trucks our fire and that we used both single and tandem uh, that we would put hopper spreaders on but then we had other equipment that you know that flat beds that we had we had the the the, the trailers the backhoe trailers and and low boy trailers that during the course of an event was just sitting on the yard and it's like, well, how can we utilize these and and look at them to make sure that we can get the these this equipment, all the equipment that we have involved in our snow and ice operation. And for us, the solution was uh, fabricating our own tanks. Um, you know, it, it's relatively, it's not a lot of cost to it um, for about, and we have different sizes. For a 500 gallon tank, it's going to run me time I get it piped in and buy the tank and, and get the actuator valve and switch. It's going to run me about a thousand dollars. Um, I will go up on a homemade, uh, that goes in flatbeds and, and even some of the smaller dump trucks to a 925 gallon tank. Um, that only runs me about $1,500. Uh, and so relatively, it's not a lot of money. Uh, for the bane that we get out of it for for snow and ice event uh, because it does allow me to utilize it and the nice thing about having the smaller tanks is again we're we're not a big workforce so I have my construction folks and they can drive it doesn't require that they have a CDL especially in the flatbeds I'll put them in a lot of nine to ten series trucks. Um, and they're basically three quarter ton and a ton truck. Um, they can drive those. And so this allows me to increase my workforce and keep my CDL operators for the dump trucks to plow and push snow and, and run the hopper spreaders. This is one of our tanks that we utilized and we put on the low boy trailer. We do the same system with a little bit smaller tank for our backhoe trailers. And basically we get the tank, we plumb it up. Uh, for that system, um, it, it, it's a little bit more, but it, it's, it certainly doesn't, when you look at the cost of a, a super tanker, um, you know, the 4,000 gallon water, water trucks that we use for salt brine, um, this, this system runs me about, uh, $9,000 total, uh, when I do that. And, uh, so there's not a lot of cost for that. Um, just keep in mind, that when you do, you got to look at the weight of what what you're putting it on, uh, versus vehicle. So you know, 23% salt brine is going to be about 9.79 pounds uh, per gallon. So when you look at what tank you buy, make sure you get all that that everything matches up uh, from a safety standpoint. And also, as you get closer to the large, these tanks have baffle systems as well. Um, uh, when we use these trailers, they're for pretreatment operations only. Uh, we do not use them for de-icing. Uh, so, you know, they're only going to be used basically on a sunny day uh, before the event starts. Once the event hits, uh, they're, they're, they're part. They're just not, uh, just don't feel like they're safe enough to put on operation 
uh, with everything going on, pulling pulling a trailer for us. So we do not use those for de-icing, just anti-icing. Uh, again, that's kind of a similar one in motion um, that we're utilizing, uh, and it does spray. Uh, one thing I don't like to do, even though I could if I wanted, um, but uh, we sort of we only limit. And again, this is gravity fed. So we're just going to do a single lane of treatment. Uh, we're not going to try to do two lanes at, at one time. Because uh, again, we're doing this for anti-icing, um, pre-treatment. Um, if you've ever been out there, and I, I've yet to figure out why anybody would do it, but it happens every time. Uh, drivers like to get right up on those trucks and just coat their car with salt brine uh, and just ride it. I, I don't know why in the world they do that, but it is operation that you'll see. Um, so it, I think from our point, uh, from a safety operation, we try to limit that to one single lane. Uh, our key thing and, and what we try to do and, and the reason we went uh, to utilizing systems like this and trying to get our brine capacity, uh, especially for our pretreatment operation, as, as much as we could, is I wanted to basically be able to say, I've treated my entire interstates and my entire primary routes uh, within six hours. Uh, ideally, I'd like to be less than six, and we can in some in instance, we'll get it down, depending on the county, we're between four to six hours. Um, used to be close to eight to 10, so uh, years ago. So I wanted to be able to get that because for us, again, it all goes down to weather and our crazy weather. Um, we may have periods where we'll get rain and before an event, and then we may get a little calm before the storm of about four to five, six hours beforehand. Uh, so I wanted to be able to say, well, when I get those calm, I can go out and pre-treat uh, and get everything done uh, within those time frames. Uh, so that's been kind of our goal uh, that we do. And, you know, ideally someday I'd like to get down to about three hours. Um, it's a little tough uh, because, you know, we're we're kind of slated on the interstate on that 77 corridor. We got a little over 300 lane miles, and then on the 85 corridor, I got a little over 900. And then I throw in my primaries, and we have a big system in South Carolina. So I'm at 3,300 lane miles of primary routes throughout our district. And then when I tack in the secondaries, uh, 9,300. So all total for our district, I've got over 13,000 lane miles um, that we're that we've got to do um, and try to get for our events. Uh, if you notice the, the slide before, we had 88 trucks. Uh, so if you're looking at a lane mile total for trying to push snow, uh, each operator is kind of responsible for about 150 lane miles per event, uh, which is really kind of spread out. Um, you know, we, we try to, you know, for the interstates, I like to try to keep it uh, a little bit more compact. Uh, and so I'm kind of looking at trying to keep it at 20 uh, lane miles per event per driver. Um, and so we, we've kind of done that. Uh, one thing I'll say, we, we're, we're in South Carolina, we're all one big, we're one big state, one big team. Uh, I'm kind of geared up for an event of about three to five inches. Anything beyond that. Uh, we, we get assistance. And a lot of times it'll affect our district and District 3, the other upstate. So we'll get assistance counties uh, from other parts of the state. Um, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. I'm afraid we've gone over our, okay. uh, our hour time. I want to thank everyone for being on the webinar today and uh, listening in as we shared the state best practices from both New York and from uh, South Carolina. Uh, again, we thank you all for participating in this second uh, state showcase webinar.